Mic check, one, two, one, two. Can we get serious now? One thing that did happen during the 60s was some music of an unusual or experimental nature did get recorded and did get released. Now look at who the executives were in those companies at those times. Not hip young guys. These were cigar-chomping old guys who looked at the product that came and said, I don't know. Who knows what it is? Record it. Stick it out of it. Sells. All right. We were better off with those guys than we are now with the supposedly hip young executives who are making the decisions of what people should see and hear in the marketplace. Success in the music business begins with a dream, a vision. This podcast will give you, the listener, the insight and tools to turn that vision into a reality. Meet the industry professionals who work day by day behind the scenes, helping to make those dreams come true. Welcome to the business side of music. This is Bob Bender. You're listening to this edition of The Business Side of Music. In the studio with us today, Nancy Moran. Nancy and I, we met at the CD Baby DIY conference. We did. We did, yeah. And then uh, I think we played a bit of phone tag after that. (laughs) Yeah, we did. I think I was more of the one that kept getting tagged. That's that's okay. (laughs) (laughs) But we finally hooked up. And then we met again at a a lunch a few weeks ago uh, with our buddy uh, Vinny Rebus with Vinny Connect. So thanks for being in the studio. Thanks for having me. Good to be here. Yeah. You know, looking at your bio, you're an independent, and I like this, folk rock Americana. And so you kind of cover all the bases. Yep. Mm-hmm. Singer-songwriter. You're also an artist development coach and the co-founder of Azalea Music Group here in Nashville, Tennessee. As an independent artist, she has released four solo CDs and performed at notable folk clubs, house concerts, and festivals across the U.S. Uh, we're going to talk about that. Uh, For eight years, she's also toured and recorded as a member of the nationally acclaimed all-female musical troupe, The Four Bitchin' Babes. You got it. Which I have seen in concert. Great show. I'm going to play with them this week, actually. Oh, excellent. (laughs) After coming off the road, Nancy designed her signature ultimate booking and touring online program, which to me, I think is in demand but a lot of people don't realize it's there. So we're going to talk about cool, that. Cool, cool. Where she teaches touring musicians and those who want to be worldwide how to get their music out to a wider audience by booking more and better paying gigs. At the same time, she's opened up her Music Mogul Academy where she provides customized private coaching to individuals, duos, and bands on the creative business and mindset sides of creating and maintaining a successful music career. Nancy is a regular presenter for organizations such as Taxi, NSAI, and Indie Connect. She is an RHI certified holistic life coach. That might be something I need. <laughs> Let's the, talk. <laughs> the former assistant editor of American Songwriter Magazine and a contributing writer to publications such as CMA Close Up Magazine. It's a lot to say. Yeah, that's a mouthful. Sorry about that. No, that's okay. (laughs) That's okay. So, you know, we we touched base. uh, We had an opportunity to meet each other at the CD Baby conference. And then we talked a little bit here before we started the show. You know, one of the things that I deal with a lot, and I think Vinny does too. Vinny and I, in fact, have had this same conversation ad nauseum. (laughs) And that is... So and so fill in the blank. Right. He's a booking agent. Right. And I just, I, first of all, I always have to say to him, I'm not a booking agent. I don't want to be one. I've actually worked at a booking agency at one time in my life. It was not fun. You feel like the artists don't need a booking agent. They totally don't. I, I completely understand why they want one. I think as artists, we all want a booking agent. And the reason that we want a booking agent is because we hate booking. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> you know, I mean, let's be serious. It, it isn't fun. There's it's dialing for dollars. It's dialing for dollars. It really is. Yeah. yeah. And it's a lot of, um, it's a lot of no's. It's a lot of rejection and you know, we're sensitive artist people. We don't like to be rejected. And right. it's a little bit like someone calling your baby ugly. Yes. Right. That's a good analogy. Yeah. Sure. So it's just, it's not fun. So we don't like to do it. And 
I think we all have this dream that someone is going to swoop in and save the day for us by being our booking agent and taking away the horribleness of all these things that we hate and just allow us to plop ourselves on stage and play. And that's all we ever have to do. Yeah. How's that worked out so far? <laughs> <laughs> it's, a, it's a really lovely dream. Yeah. And I like to daydream about that myself yeah. sometimes, but it's not reality. It's just not reality. Yeah. I, I know that a former part partner of mine and I, we tried to get this into some of our clients' heads that, okay, stop looking at us as booking agents. We're not, we're consultants and get out there and pound the pavement on your own. And they're like deathly afraid. What is it that they're afraid of other than just being afraid? That's a, an excellent question. They're afraid of a lot of things actually. And I think fear is probably one of the biggest things that stops artists from being successful. It comes in a lot of forms, actually. Uh, fear is sometimes shows up as procrastination. It can show up as avoidance. It can show up as things like, I hate booking, yeah, <laughs> you know? Right. Um, it's really just fear, I think, of... Well, it certainly is fear of rejection. Although, to me, fear of rejection and fear of success are just two sides of the same coin. It's the same. It, it really is. It's heads or tails. Yeah, it really is. Yeah. Um, so I don't even make a distinction there. Um, I think a lot of it is fear of not knowing what to do. Like I remember when, before I really started my career, when I was really, really super green, it was just nerve wracking to me to pick up a telephone and talk to someone that I didn't know and feel like I didn't know what to say. Like I just truly didn't understand how to start the conversation. Hi, I want a booking. I mean, it just sounds silly and stupid. Yeah. And I think we don't like to feel inadequate. So to me, a lot of the fear comes from that is just not knowing how to approach it, what to say, not wanting to feel inadequate and, certainly not wanting to be turned down, turned down over and over and over <laughs> again, um, because that just feels horrible. You know, I also think we just, I think we have this dream that we just want to be able to do the things that feel good. <laughs> you know, if you've had any type of job ever your entire life, that wasn't music, there are parts of the job that you like and parts of the job that you don't. And that is no different with music. And booking is the part of the job that we don't like, but in order to do the thing that we love, which is to get on stage in front of people, that's what we have to do. And so if you can look at it from a different approach, if you can look at it as in booking allows me to get on stage and perform in front of people, booking allows me to do the thing that I love to do, booking allows me to get my music in front of people and to express it to the world. If you can look at it in that way, as opposed to, oh God, I hate doing booking, then maybe it gives you a better chance. It's part of the equation. And that's what you have to understand. It's it's part of the big picture. Totally. Yeah. And relying on some somebody else to do your booking is nice. And it's to me, it's kind of a lazy way out. Totally. But also you're paying that person. Now, some people don't have a problem with that. And you know what? A good booking agent is worth their weight in gold. I'll say that right up. Yeah, front. if you can find one. Yeah, but that's <laughs> the thing you have to remember. A good booking agent is also representing probably fill in a number, 10, 20, oh. 30, 50, 100 different acts. And for them, it's dialing for dollars. They, they, you know, a good booking agent at some point gets more inbound calls than they do outbound calls. Yeah. And, and they're getting the best money they can. But if you're just starting in this business, you've got to understand in your mind, you don't want to be kind of glopped into that because, you know, at about the end of four weeks, you're going to be calling them going, well, has anything happened? Right. Well, here's the thing. You know, when I, when I was with the four bitch and babes, uh, for eight years, we had a booking agent. We had a, an extremely good booking agent and really big, uh, company based out of Madison, Wisconsin. And they liked us and they had more than one person working on us. They had different people in different areas of the country. Right. And we still didn't get some gigs that we all wanted 
because, and it wasn't that they weren't doing their job. I'm not knocking the booking agent, but I think what people don't understand is that there's a lot more to booking than just picking up the phone and getting a gig. It doesn't work that way. So even when you have a good booking agent, it doesn't guarantee you the gig. That's right. And those booking agents, as much as they loved us, no, nobody else is going to have the passion for your music that you have for your music. That's right. Nobody. I don't. All right. Maybe your mother, but, <laughs> but sometimes not but, even your mom. But she's not going to get on the phone. And make Exa- phone exactly. Either. So, you know, it really, I just can't stress enough that I feel like people, especially when they're starting out, I feel like artists need to do their own booking. If for no other reason than they need to understand the process, they need to know how to represent themselves to these venues. They've got to tell the booking agent how to do it. They've got to pass along that information. You know, the booking agents aren't going to just create this stuff out of the clear blue sky. That's right. So in order for you to understand how to present yourself as an artist, how to present yourself to a venue or anybody else, a record label, publisher, it doesn't matter. You have to have that knowledge and you've got to work through that foundational work of figuring out how to describe your music, how to say why you're different, what sets you apart, why they want to book you, what you bring to the table. You know, you've got to be able to think about it from their side of things and not just me, 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 me all the time. And understand that when you're calling these different types of venues and we're going to talk about different types of venues that you're not the only one calling them. oh gosh no you know you talk about a competitive world <laughs> because they're probably in there they're going great it's another call that's right yeah. uh, it's, it's, and really artists don't understand that they just don't understand it and i don't know how to get them to understand that that part i think I really learned a lot about how we come across as artists when I worked at the magazine. Because when I started at American Songwriter Magazine, I answered the phones. That's what I did. Yeah. And and I opened the mail and things like that. And I was stunned at the types of calls that we would get and what people would say and the types of letters we would get and how ridiculous these people sounded uh, and looked in in print you know I don't I think it was just total ignorance I really do I think they had no idea that by presenting themselves that way they immediately showed that they were an amateur immediately and I was new so if I could see it right imagine what the rest of the industry the, the seasoned professional at a certain venue who's you know getting 40 50 calls a month. Right. Yeah, exactly. And and I think the expression ignorance is bliss <laughs> is nice, but not in this capacity. No, really isn't. It really isn't. Yeah. Yeah. We're going to take a break. And when we come back, I definitely want to talk about some more things. You, you sent me bullet points and uh, I want to try and get them all in today because oh. I think they're they're all actually good. All right. Awesome. We're yeah. going to talk about a lot of different stuff yeah, then. That's good. <laughs> that's okay. We got time. This is Bob Bender in the studio with us today, Nancy Moran, and this is going to be a great conversation, so you got to stay tuned because we've got some really interesting topics to go over, and you're listening to this edition of The Business Side of Music. Hi, this is Greg Seneff with the Seneff Law Office, and you're listening to The Business Side of Music. You're listening to The Business Side of Music. Hi, this is Vinny Rebus, the founder of Vinny Connect. Our goal is to ensure that you have the knowledge, the tools, skills, resources, and connections that you need to develop a profitable and long-lasting career in music. One way we do this is through these Business Side of Music podcasts. I'd also like to invite you to check out Indie Connect magazine, our free multimedia online publication packed with practical interviews and advice from music industry experts. Go to www.indieconnectmag. That's www.indieconnectmag.com. Let us walk with you and guide you every step of your musical journey. You're listening to the business side of music. 
This is Bob Bender. We're back in the studio here in Nashville, Tennessee with Nancy Moran, uh, an independent folk rock Americana singer-songwriter, artist development coach, and the co-founder of Azalea Music Group. Let's also not forget that she was a member of the Four Bitchin' Babes. That's right. Which I saw in concert and absolutely loved. Cool. You know, we, we talk about bookings and you don't need a booking agent. Here's an interesting concept. If you're an artist that's just starting out, and I use this because we had an artist on the show some months back who I was intrigued by. I actually found her on Facebook, liked her music. She did a lot of cover songs, but she did some original tunes. But what I liked about her was she was promoting this living room couch concert tour across the nation. She goes, I'm going to be in Oklahoma tonight. I'm going to be in New Mexico in a couple of days. And, and I'm looking for a gig in Colorado. And I thought, how novel of an approach. And, and so I talked to her and I said, well, you know, how are you doing? And she goes, I'm booked all the time. Yeah. She's kind of fearless. I'll tell you yeah, that. Right. Let's talk about looking beyond typical music venues. Cause you know, they're not all going to be that, nice piece of cake with buttercream frosting, which I happen to like if anybody's listening, so my way. Uh, but no, I, you know, they're not all going to be that perfect venue. You may right. wind up playing in somebody's living room or back room, backyard. And I want to tell you, in fact, uh, a good buddy of mine, we've had him on the show, Jeff Wyrick, who's the tour manager for Eddie Money. Eddie Money has done backyard concerts. Now they pay him handsomely. Yeah, I'm sure they do. But he'll do it. Absolutely. Well, here's the thing. First of all, I have a really good friend who always says they can't all be gems, (laughs) you know, (laughs) and that is the truth. Sometimes they're a piece of coal. That's right. (laughs) That is right. Uh, But we take them all, you know, we're we're, we're playing and how bad can it be if you're playing? And if, and if you're not taking them, somebody else is. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. But here's the thing about these uh, house concerts, living room tours, backyards, whatever you want to call them. There's a whole network of house concerts out there. And then there's people like I'm guessing what you're saying this girl was doing. She's probably booking herself in fan living rooms. You know, right. her fans are booking right. her and, yeah. and that, which is an awesome way to do it. I'm telling you, I've done some house concerts and those are some of the best gigs I've ever had. Ever. And I've played performing arts centers that are 2,000 seats, you know, and but I've had a house concert that had 75 people in it and it was awesome. But here's something else and, and another story to share. You don't know who's in that audience. Right. Absolutely. Aaron Benward with Blue County uh, went over to Europe to perform in and I think I've shared this story before, but they wound up at a gig in London and there were two people in the audience. Now he could have taken the easy way out and done a 20, 30 minute show and said, thank you very much. I'm out of here. But instead he and his buddy got up and they did their entire concert Good in front that. of two people. Well, guess what happened? The next day there was an article in the London times from one of the people that was in the audience. Cause it happened to be the entertainment writer for the paper. <laughs> I love that. Yeah. I love that story. So How you great. never know. Absolutely. I learned that really early on. So, someone was kind enough, uh, a person who was influential in my life was kind enough to say exactly that. You never know who's sitting in that off audience. So if there's five people or 500 people, you do the same show. And I think that's a really interesting and uh, profound lesson. And, and I think that's something you need to approach when you do a show is everybody, absolutely everybody in that audience is important. No question. Yeah. No question. Yeah. yeah. Well, and it doesn't even have to be that it's someone writing for a paper or someone from a record label, whatever. You never know the person who's sitting there who becomes your biggest fan might have a lot of money themselves and might book you for some private event, or they might know someone who works for a huge corporation and they get you on some fabulous gig, or they know the person who runs the festival down the street, which happens to be the biggest festival on the East Coast. Or You just, you just never know what the connections are. You don't. And understand that everybody you're performing for is not maybe just a potential gig or a fan, but they, at the end of the day, may become a consumer and be buying your product and buying your t-shirts. Totally. I mean, and that's the thing about these house concert gigs is to me, in a lot of ways, you're making a stronger connection with people than you are when you're playing in front of 2000 people, you know? So why are you doing music? This is a big question I always ask people. It's like, do you know why you're doing music? And it's not because you love to play. It's not because you like the applause. It's not because you want to be famous. Those might all be reasons that that's great. But if you dig deeper, I promise you there is a much deeper reason. There's a why that is driving you to do this because let's be serious. 
<laughs> if you don't have a why driving you, you would get a job that actually pays you some money. Okay? Well, and we've said this so many times on the show is you do this because you're passionate about it, not right. because you're going to get rich. Of course you do. Yeah. Of course. It, the people who do it because they think they're going to get rich and famous don't last long is what I find. Right. Because they quickly realize how much work goes into this process yeah. and it's not worth it. It's not worth it at all. So figure out your why. Why are you doing this? And my guess is that your why Somewhere in your why, it includes connecting with people, making a difference on our planet or whatever. And that's a connection process. And you can't beat the connection that you'll make at a house concert. It's, it's, uh, it's phenomenal. And, and you often make fans for life, literally. So how do you go about doing a house concert? A house concert. First of all, there's, um, there's a bunch of different directories out there. Look for... I think houseconcerts.com is still going. If not, look for houseconcerts.org or just search for house concerts on Google. Um, there's a bunch of different sites. You can look by state. You can ask your fans to do a house concert. It doesn't even have to be something that's organized already outside of you, like a venue. Um, that's what a lot of people do is they just offer it to their fans and they they sort of teach them how to do a and house concert. And let them do the heavy lifting. Right. Yeah. In fact, I, I know one girl, I thought this was awesome. She travels in a van with tabletops, like these big round tabletops that you can put over top of littler tables, right? Mm -hmm. And little candles. So she'll go into someone's house and literally set up a coffee house feel with these little cute round tables and chairs. I think she might even travel with some chairs. I'm not sure. What a novel idea. Yeah, it's so cool. Yeah. It's so awesome. And it's a lot of work, but she loves it. It creates the atmosphere that she wants. It helps the people who are doing the house concert. And it creates, it really makes it not a gig. It makes it an event. People will come to this because it's novel. It's like you're doing what in your house? You know, they'll come just for that. I think that's such a an important component to understand is that make it fun. Yeah. You know, doesn't yeah. all have to, it is going to be some work involved, right? but, but make it fun, have a good time. And I was thinking as you were talking, once again, you're reaching out to those fans that become long-term totally consumers. I, I, yeah. I don't want to overuse that word, but you know, I hear so much from artists saying, well, you know, you can't make any money because it's streaming and they're not even doing downloads and yeah. Okay. You know what? The physical product is still out there, but you're going to sell most of it at an event, at a show, at a concert. Yeah. I got to tell you right now, performing live is where it's at. That's where the money is right now. And all right, I'm going to sidetrack. So remind me where I was going because okay. I want to come back to that. Oh, Lord, <laughs> Lord you're asking me. I, I know, I know. We'll, we'll do it. I know we'll do it. Okay. Um, first of all, if you're complaining about what's going wrong in the industry right now, you need to work on your mindset because, yeah, you can say, oh, streaming, nobody's buying CDs, whatever. Okay, fine. There's always going to be some part of the business that's not working to our liking, yeah. but I guarantee you it's going to come back around, maybe not in the same form, but it is going to come back around. And if that part's not working, there's some other part that's working. Right now, touring and performing live is where it is at. And the reason it's so important and why it's working is because everything that we do in our life right now is online. Everything is us sitting at home in our underwear and talking to people online. We're not physically around people that much anymore. If you have a day job, that's a different thing, but you know, yeah, for, for exactly. a lot of people, especially as artists, we are really by ourselves and we just, people in general, and when we go out to, uh, to dinner, look around the restaurant and how many people are looking at their phones and not talking to the person oh my gosh. across the table from them. Ask okay? my wife. <laughs> right. She'll say to me, put the phone it's, down. It's huge. And yeah. I, you know, I know this and I even find myself doing it. When you can get people to come to a show to f experience music live, that is a phenomenal experience for them right now because there's very little like that going on. Mm -hmm. It's not on television. It's not being streamed over the internet. You know, it's, they're sitting in the same room. And when, when those frequencies are bouncing around the room that you are sitting in, I'm telling you it's different. It's just different and it makes an enormous impact. And so live music is I mean, look at the, look at the big artists. Why are they getting 
$500 a ticket, yes. you know, that's why they're, that's why they're getting those fees is because people are desperate to have that connection and that communication. It's a, it's a, it's a certain amount of intimacy. Totally. You know, in, even in, if there's 50,000 people, yeah, it's still you, intimate. You, you connect. And as I said earlier, when you, you as the artist look at a person face to face and you look into their eyes and they're looking at yours, they're making a connection that you can't get by listening to it on your laptop or your totally. tablet or your, your phone. Totally. It's so important. We're going to take a break and we come back. We got so much more to talk about here. <laughs> But I got the time if you got the time. I do. We'll be here for a week. That's right. <laughs> Two shows nightly, folks. <laughs> Don't forget to tip your server. <laughs> this is Bob Bender. We're in the studio with Nancy Moran. And we got a lot to talk about here. You're listening to this edition of the Business Side of Music. Hi, this is Judy Rodman. And I'm a vocal coach, among other things. And you are listening to the Business Side of Music with Bob Bender. You're listening to the Business Side of Music. Wow, I just joined the Music Starts Here community. This is a truly hidden gem for anyone in the music business. Whether you live in Nashville or anywhere else in the world, Music Starts Here is like a GPS for your music career. This is the place to be if you want to get advice and direction from some seriously talented musical people who have been where you want to go. Music news, events, and a great big community with resources for artists, songwriters, musicians, studio and tech, along with music business advice from pros in the industry, all on one site? Make sure you get your free profile now. Go to www.musicstartshere.org. That's musicstartshere.org. You're listening to the business side of music. This is Bob Bender. We're back in the studio. Actually, we never went anywhere. I, I got <laughs> to figure don't out tell some other that. way to say that sometime. <laughs> anyway, we're back in the studio with Nancy Moran, and we're going down this list of, of topics. You know, we talk about artists need to learn how to book themselves. Yeah. And you have this ultimate booking and, and touring online program, which we're going to talk about sure. before you walk out the door. And we talked about mindset issues that are holding you back. I think, you know, we, we talked about that there's nothing to fear but fear itself. I think, you know, Franklin Roosevelt said that, and it's, and it's very true. And we talked about looking beyond typical music venues outside of Yes. Living room concerts. Of course. What other? Love to. Oh, great. Um, there's so many um, others. There's just so many others. Let's see. Some hi, of my favorites Emily, are there is an association for virtually of anything music. you can think of out there. There is literally an association hi, of associations. This is Emily Satterley, <laughs> not, the I'm not kidding. Of okay. Um, yeah, and I believe it. Almost all of, of these associations out there have conferences, regional or national or whatever, you know, once a year, maybe once a month, who knows. But they have events. And most of those associations have speakers and or entertainers at some point in that event. Most of these associations have money to pay for those speakers and or entertainment. So those are some of my, my all time favorite. One example is when I was with the four bitch and babes, we did a gig in New Orleans. I am not making this up. That was pest world. 2000 and whatever year it was that we were there. Pest World. This was an a conference of the national, oh shoot, I'm going to forget the name of the association. It's like National Pest Management Association. I, I think it was, I Exterminators. Think that was it. Yeah. Yeah. It's exactly what it was. So it was, it was an entire conference of the guys who come to your house and, and spray it for bugs. Right. Okay. So that sounds really silly and goofy. And why would the four bitch and babes play that conference? I'll tell you exactly why. Most of the people who are in pest control are men, most of them, but their conference is in New Orleans. So what did they do? They brought their wives with them because it's a great place to go visit. Right. Yeah. So during the day, the men are all in these workshops learning about the new chemicals or new features, who knows what they're learning about, right? And the women have nothing to do. So the association takes it upon themselves to run what they call a spouse program. They had a luncheon, and guess who was the entertainment for the luncheon? I'm going to say the four bitch and Hey, <laughs> way to go, Bob. I win the prize. <laughs> And it was an awesome gig. It was an awesome gig. We had fun. The ladies had fun. It was totally our our type of audience. Our audience is, is mostly women. Right. And so um, it worked out great. And we got 
paid a boatload of money and they flew us down to New Orleans and put us in a hotel. Yeah. Okay. So that's the type of. And guess what? Four Bitch and Babes didn't necessarily have a hit at radio. You guys weren't oh on the latest Ellen show. No, you know? no, no, like not at all. In yeah. fact, a lot of people haven't heard of us. You know, p- plenty of people haven't heard of us. And that was one of the things about being in that group. One of the major things that I learned is we would often go into a town in, uh, and I'm not making this up either, like the middle of Iowa or Idaho and a small town. No one had ever heard of us. They had no idea who we were and we would sell the place out. We would sell out anywhere from say like 300 to 600 seats. Well, in a lot of cases in those, you know, I, I call them secondary or even tertiary, tertiary markets. markets. Mm-hmm. You know, it's uh, it's a community concert of sorts. We were the event. We were the yeah. event for that for that evening. And you're uh, probably the event for maybe that six months or three months or a year. You don't know. Right. Yeah. But part of what made it for us was we had great marketing materials and it was booked as a girl's night out. And we had, you know, we had radio spots and we had a cartoon that was our logo and things like that. And so just by all the things that they heard about the concert, they had no idea who we were. It didn't matter who we were. It didn't matter that they knew our names. Heck, by the time they left the show, they were always getting us confused. They just watched all four of us on stage and they would come up to me and think I was Debbie, you know. But that brings out uh, another point here. When you talk about going in prepared, press kits versus EPKs, you know, there is a difference. Yeah. And and you say what to include, how to stand out, you know, what you just described as standing out. Totally. Talk about this this, uh, cartoon. Oh, I thought this was actually really brilliant. This was uh, Sally Fingeret and Debbie Smith, who Sally's the only original babe left in the group. The group's, by the way, been around for 28 years now. So it's been going a long time. And at some point, they started out playing folk venues, really nice folk venues, like the Birchmere in Alexandria, Virginia, or the Ark in Ann Arbor, things like that. And at some point, they were starting to transition to performing art centers, which are theaters across the country. And that's where they really needed pretty high-end marketing materials. And so Sally and Debbie, and I think our booking agent at the time, had a meeting and kind of came up with this concept that they needed something to represent the group that automatically showed it was fun. And what's more fun than a cartoon? Right. And Sally happens to know Flash Rosenberg, who's a great cartoonist, and she's the one who came up with the cartoon. And she's done all kinds of different iterations and little little knick-knacky things in cartoons. I mean, it's, it's just fascinating. If anybody wants to see it, go to fourbitchandbabes.com and you can see the type of graphics that we used. So, you know, that cartoon to me was brilliant because it wasn't just a headshot. And if I can do the flip side to, to give another example of what didn't work, what was fascinating was there was one time that we did take a headshot. We did have headshots that we could send people. And we took a headshot and we were all dressed in black And uh, we had our hair and makeup really fancy done. And we all had big pieces of jewelry on because when we dress for the show, that's sort of how we do it. Somebody said to us once that they saw just the headshot. This is all they saw. And they thought we were a classical group because that's what was going around those days. And the classical groups were all dressed up and all in black. And we went. Oh, well, that didn't work, did yeah. it? You know? <laughs> Hence, you know, the cartoon really represented the group. Well, they didn't have to know who we were just by looking at the cartoon. They were like, I want to see that show. And so it comes down to when you put your, when you put your material together, kind of have an idea. I shouldn't say kind of. Have an idea of what you're going to include in that that's going to catch their attention first time out. Absolutely. And not mislead them, not take them down a different path that you don't want them to go down. What I find that a lot of artists do, and I again, I think it's just ignorance. They just don't know better. They sort of look around to see what everybody else is doing right? and copy, copy their type of picture, how it looks. And how do you know that's actually working? It's for not those usually people? right. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but it looks good. It looks good and everybody else is doing it. So it must be right. Yeah. Yeah. Not necessarily. We talked about that uh, before we started taping the show as, you know, thinking outside the box. And I said, get rid of the box. You say crush the box, crush the box. You yeah. Know? Yeah. Because you're still 
setting up parameters and boundaries and, yeah. and, and the such. We got a lot more to talk about, but we really do need to take another break and get uh, another one of our sponsors in here. So in the studio today here in Nashville, Tennessee, Nancy Moran discussing all things cool about, I think, being an independent artist, but getting out there and working yourself and not relying on other people. Absolutely. Yeah. You're listening to this edition of the Business Side of Music. Hi, this is Emily Satterley, the founder of ItdyDiddy.com, and you're listening to the Business Side of Music. You're listening to the business side of music. Hi, this is Chris from Sync Songwriter. If you've been trying to get your music into TV and film, but have no idea where to start, I'm launching my new four-part video training workshop this week. It's completely free, and you're going to learn how to connect with the right people in licensing. Imagine being able to make a living from your music, build your reputation in the licensing industry, and be recognized as the great songwriter that you are. I've been an award-winning music producer for 20 years and have helped countless artists get their songs into TV and film. People who have taken my training have gotten their music on a network such as Netflix, CBS, Bravo. They've scored full-length movies and gotten music into Hollywood movie trailers. The workshop is going to be four hours of teaching and training examples, case studies, and even clips of interviews I've done with top music supervisors in the industry. Just go to SyncSongwriter.com and sign up now to reserve your spot in the class. If you've dreamed of getting your songs into TV and film, this is going to show you how to do that step by step. So head over to SyncSongwriter.com and sign up for the workshop now. I'll see you there. You're listening to the business side of music. This is Bob Bender. You're listening to this edition of the Business Side of Music. In the studio with us today, Nancy Moran. I, I got to tell you, it's just the conversations we have off the air are just as <laughs> good as, as what everybody's listening to here. Uh, let's bounce back. You know, we talked about music venues, and, and let's kind of yeah. get back into that world. Because you asked me not to forget, and oh, right. you well, actually I, reminded I, me. I so. did actually come back to the one point I was going to make then, but I do want to talk about some other venues. So there's things like nursing homes and, and retirement centers, things like that. And people think that the people who play there only play for free. And I hate to tell you, but they, they don't. And they also think, oh, you know, they're cover gigs, you know, what kind of fun would that be? Or it's a catatonic audience. Right. And I, I know more and more people that are playing these gigs. Here's what's great about them. They're usually daytime gigs. They're usually only an hour long and you can make anywhere from like a hundred to three hundred dollars that I know of. Depending which, on where you are. Which if you're a solo artist, that's a nice little pickup to do until that's, you have a gig that night. That's exactly or at my least point. pays for the hotel room and food and gas and And you can often I know tons of people that do more than one a day. It's only an hour. So, uh, and you know, the audience is right there. So if you do another one, that's five miles down the road, it doesn't matter because it's a completely new yeah, audience. They're not traveling. Yeah. They don't care. No. <laughs> right. You know, so, uh, you can often do more than one. And these are great gigs to do while you're touring because you can make some money during the day, especially if you're, if you're doing openings or, or starting a new market where you're not making a lot of money at the quote unquote good music gig, you know, where you get to play your original music, you may not be making the money that you need to make from those. So this is one way that you can make money and afford to do those tours and play the places that you want to. And here's the novel concept. You're doing something nice. You're doing something good and you're going to feel good when it's over with. I literally don't know one single person doing these gigs that hasn't raved about them. I'm not, I'm not making that up. I don't know anybody who's like, yeah, I do this as my day gig. It's, you know, it's it's just what gets me through. Like everybody I know that does them is like, oh my God, these are the best audiences and I have the best time. And think about it for a second. You've got an audience that has, for the most cases, probably seen just about everything in their life Mm -hmm. in one aspect or another. And you're you're really capturing a new audience still. Absolutely. You know? So what's wrong with that? Absolutely. Yeah. It's keeping your chops up. You know, and there's so many reasons to do it. Would I was having a conversation just the other day and I was like, you know, would you rather play music as your day job or would you rather work at Home Depot? You know, your yeah. choice. I don't know. I, funny me, I'd rather just play music. Yeah. So. And I'd rather shop at. <laughs> That's great. Well, at least Lowe's, if not Home Depot. Okay, all right, yeah. all right. I, was, I wasn't taking sides there. <laughs> yeah. 
So, all right, that's one. Then there's schools and libraries and churches even. And when I say churches, it does not mean you have to play religious music. There are plenty of churches out there who have coffee houses and other events that they literally do as community outreach. Right. That's what they're doing it for. Um, I've played a ton of those and I do not play religious music. Anybody who knows me knows that I do not. I don't even come close to that. Uh, in fact, I think I even swear in one song and I did it at that coffee house. Ooh. And you weren't struck by lightning. I was not. I was not. So, but I am going to pray for you. Okay. So. <laughs> Thank you. I appreciate that. Um, So those can be really, really great gigs. Oh, there's just so many, you know, the other, how do you find them? Well, is it one of these get on, find an association list somewhere or, you know, you'd be surprised how much you can find on Google. First of all, there are a lot of directories out there, but also there are things like Indie on the Move is, is a great one that they do all different types of venues all across the country. Um, And it's run by musicians and, um, there's Musicians Atlas that keeps a bunch of lists of things. Now, all right, maybe they don't have some of the weird ones. So if you're looking for schools or libraries, I just go on to, I just go on to Google and look for a particular, in that particular area. In that market. In right. that area, yeah. right. Yeah. I'm sure there actually are probably some lists and directories of schools. If you join like the Arts Council and things like that, you can, you can probably get a list There's lots of different ways to do it. But when you call, make sure you talk to the right person, too. Absolutely. Because a lot of times you're going to get the gatekeeper, and the gatekeeper may just be a receptionist. That's right. You know? That's right. So find out who that person is before you give the speech that you should have fine-tuned and, you know, know exactly what you're going to say. Find out who the person is. Hey, is so-and-so in? I'd love to talk with them. Absolutely. And that goes for any type of gig. It does. You know, yeah. I don't care who you're calling, uh, that you want to make sure that you're talking to the right. If you're calling a club and you want to get a, a gig at a certain club, you're not going to talk to the barkeep, right. or, you know, or one of the servers. You want to know who the buyer is for the venue. It's the same thing with what you're talking about. Coffee yep. houses, schools, churches, uh, retirement homes, etc. Yeah. And, and really when you get down to it, the booking process, the actual process itself is very similar. There's very little difference it's just really about finding who you're talking to and maybe thinking about what it is that they're looking for. I mean, the person who's booking a nursing home is looking for something different than the guy who's running a listening room, you know? I want to maybe sidebar for a second sure. here because, you know, you, you talk about making your tour profitable. Uh, and I love the, the sub context you have in there. It says not spending everything you make. I know <laughs> that one. <laughs> That's a whole nother story for another episode. Yes. But, you know, knowing what your worth is when you're on the phone. I mean, you have to have some kind of an idea of, of, you know, at least a baseline. Knowing, first of all, bottom dollar, this is what it's going to cost me to go from point A to point B. And you're not doing this for your good looks. You're doing it because you love it and you're passionate. But you got to be able to put some money in the gas tank and in your pocket. Absolutely. This is a huge question that I get all the time. And I talk about it a a lot in in my program. And one of the things that I like to do is I like to do the math. I'm a math girl. You just have to literally take a piece of paper and a pencil and figure out what are your expenses going to be? If you're going to be on the road for five days, where are you staying? Are you staying in hotels? Are you staying on people's sofas? You know, do you have expenses? How far are you traveling and figure out how much gasoline it's going to take you and what's the gasoline price these days and how much is that? What, what type of mileage do you get in your vehicle? If you're driving a huge van, it's not getting as good as the Honda, you right. know, Accord. And do you need that huge van? Do you need the huge van? Unless you're hauling a big sound system and right. pyro and, you know, a few other things. Right, maybe exactly. you don't need that. Do you have to provide the sound at these places? Are you renting it? Are you bringing it with you? What are you doing for food? What, you know, what's that going to cost you on the road? There are all these things that you've got to add up. And then... You do have to figure out how long are you playing? Are you doing two sets? Are you the opener or the headline? What should you really be paid for that gig? And this is where it gets tough, I think, for people because they don't know. They don't know what other people are getting. It's just something that you have to do some fairly major research about, you know, you've really got to look into it. I admit that, you know, there's places, coffee houses and some music clubs and things 
you're going to make a hundred bucks or 150 bucks and that's it. Then they're just not going to pay you anymore. Um, but there are other places where you could certainly get more than that. And in fact, if you lowball yourself, they don't look at at you as well. Like, that, thank you for bringing that yeah. up. You have to have a certain amount of self-worth. Yeah, you totally do. And and, and there's there's a market value for that. Yeah, 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 there is. So we talk a lot about that is trying to figure out, you know, what you should be asking for at particular types of gigs because it's all over the map. You know, again, if you're playing a music venue, you might only get 150 bucks. But if you're booking an association gig, and you ask for less than fifteen hundred, they're going to figure you're an amateur. I know people that are doing association gigs that are making five grand. Right. You know. Now you can't start there necessarily. No, because but there is a certain amount of word of mouth that Absol- once you get started and you do a good job, absolutely, and you're easy to work with and you're professional. And that's that has more to do with it than anything, especially yeah. for those big gigs. If you're quality of music not necessarily your quantity but if your quality of music is not nearly as good as maybe some others mm-hmm. but everybody says you know that person was great to work with oh my gosh and man they went head over hills and they stayed around for an hour or two hours afterwards right. and you know shook hands what i call a grip and grin and took photos you know that goes a long ways i don't think people understand the significance of that as is what i find because i find that that's way more important than your talent like way more yeah (laughs) you know yeah Uh, at least on the same playing field yeah totally yeah 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 don't sell yourself short as an artist just because the gig is over or or, or maybe i should say don't think that it's done right when the gig is over because it's not you know willie Uh nelson Probably still to this day when the show's over, he'll sit on the edge of the stage with his fans and he'll meet each one individually and take a picture and talk to him. You know, I've done a couple of Willie Nelson shows where it's taken him an hour or two. They've loaded up the trucks and the buses and they're ready to go and he's still sitting there. And people remember that. They probably remember that more than what he played that night. That's right. You know, yeah. they're going to go home and tell all their friends, oh, my God, I met Willie Nelson. And he sat on the edge of the stage and he waited. And I was the last one or the second to the last one, but he stayed the whole time. They're never, ever going to forget that. So if you're Jane Doe or John Smith, it's no different. Totally. Yeah. Totally. You're, and especially when you're in that building stage, you're trying to build your audience. You're trying to build your consumers. You know, we're coming back around full circle to what we talked about near the beginning is it's that community. It's that yeah. being in front of people and making that connection with people that's so important um, and sometimes more important than the music itself. I'm not, I don't want to take away from the music because I think that the music is... You still better be good. Absolutely. Yeah. I I always tell people, I assume that when I'm talking to you, I'm just assuming I'm taking for granted that you have the talent and the, and the means to deliver. I'm just going to assume that. Yeah. Um, because if you don't have that, I I can't help you. You, that's the first thing you have to work on. And please understand it is, we've said this before on the show. It's a deep pool out there. There's a lot of talent. in it. A lot of talent, a lot of talent. But the other thing I, I also tell people is there's room for literally everyone there is absolutely but everyone. you have to find your home you have to find your people yeah no question you, you know how speaking of that yes how can people find you i'm pretty easy to find uh there's a couple different places you can find me at azaleamusic.com which i know is hard to spell it's like the flower a-z-a-l-e-a music.com you can find me with my course at ultimate booking and and it's all spelled out including the and which i think everybody who's listening to this who wants to aspire to be something needs to do that thank you thank yeah, you absolutely. um and uh you can always uh reach me at my email nancy at nancy moran.com so if you remember my name you can remember my email happy to hear from people um with the course itself, it's all online and you can take it anytime you want. At your own pace. At your own pace, yeah. But I, I always try to emphasize that it's not. I'm not going to just give you the course and then disappear. That's not my style. So I do have a Facebook group that I'm very active on and they can always get a hold of me. So while they're taking the course, I'm there. I'm there to help them because my goal truly, I can't emphasize this enough, I want more and more people to be out playing music. I think it's so important right now in particular. Yes, because we really need to reconnect. 
Totally. We're so disconnected with our phones. This is so important. If, If you're seeing and feeling things in our world these days that feels disconcerting to you, that's part of the reason is because we're, we're also solo and we've, we've lost touch and we need, we need to change that. And music is perfect for that because it's literally a frequency that is changing the world. And it crosses so many boundaries, so many generations, so many demographics. So many, like yeah. all of them. And and that's why to me it's all important because maybe I don't like somebody's music. It doesn't matter. I'm not their people. My music probably won't touch their people. So I can't get to everybody. So I need their music to be out there to touch the people that it's meant to touch. Right. Um, so I'm... I'm super passionate about this. Um, Gee, I can't tell yeah, at all. Yeah, I know. I know. Uh, but it, it's real. It's like a visceral thing for me. I, I need people to be out there playing their music in the world because I think it's one of the ways that we're going to change things and it needs to be done. Well, obviously, we have a lot more to talk about, so we're going to have to get you back on, on awesome. another episode. I would love to. Great. Nancy, thanks for being on the show. You're welcome. The business side of music is the creation of Tom Sabella and Tracy Snow and is produced by Bob Bender. Co-producer for the show is Vinny Rivas. The business side of music is recorded at Music Dog Studios in Los Angeles, California and Nashville, Tennessee. Production sound design by Keith Stark. Voiceover and promo by Lisa Buson.